Okay. Um, any questions to start with on, I guess, anything at this point? Ring closure and expansion? Uh, I think we'll, we should probably skip the ring closure and expansion for the moment. Because um, that's a little bit beyond what we want to talk about at this point. So I think we'll, we'll skip that. Was that in the book or just in my video? It was, yeah, it may not be in the book, and there's a reason why. So. We'll skip over that, Sabrina. Um, I don't know if the diamonds are contributing explanation. We talked about the partial overlap. Yes. Okay. okay, so for the dienes, so initially we'll spend more time talking on Wednesday about dienes and getting into what they add to, but a, a basically a conjugated diene is one where it goes a double bond, single bond, double bond, they alternate. And it turns out that conjugated dienes, where the double bonds are separated by one single bond, so this would be a conjugated diene. A conjugated diene is more stable than if we have an extra uh, single bond in there. This is what I would call an isolated double bond uh, or diene. So diene means two alkenes, and so when it's isolated, the double bonds react independent. So if I was to add HCl to an isolated diene, I would add HCl, Markovnikov, 50-50. There's no issue. But when they're conjugated, you get a different series of reactions. And so we'll talk about that on Wednesday, because it's called 1-2 and 1-4 addition. But conjugated dienes, the reason that they are more stable is because all of the carbons in the conjugated diene are sp2. And so what happens is, is that if you think about drawing out those sp2 hybrid orbitals, they would look like this. And we would have the H here, an H there. On the end, we would have an H and an H, and so all those carbons basically would be in the same plane. So if I'm looking at it sort of down the plane here, I see all the sp2 hybrid orbitals. And all the sp2, or all the, sorry, these are unhybridized p orbitals. All of the p orbitals are basically parallel to each other. So when we form the double bond, we overlap those two, but in the middle two carbons, there's actually those p orbitals are still parallel to each other. And so what happens is, is that there is actually a partial, there's a sort of a what we call a partial pi bond that forms between those two carbons. And so in essence, you could think about that, it's not quite true, but it's almost like that's one continuous pi bond. It's not, but in terms of these two being in a position where they might overlap a little bit, they do. And so, I mean, this was believed to be the case for probably up until about maybe 10 years ago, because nobody had ex exact experimental evidence that that partial double bond existed. It was just believed to be the case. Um, so uh, one of the professors over at Oberlin uh, who was working with somebody, I believe, in Germany using high-resolution IR, um, they actually were able to show, and this was the first experimental evidence, which is why it took, why, you know, it's only been 10 years or so, um, they still see him occasionally. He's retired, but and he had undergraduate students working with him on this project. They found that this bond was a little bit shorter than a normal carbon-carbon single bond, and that was the evidence that that was a partial overlap because it was a bond length that was longer than a double bond but shorter than a single bond, and so they were actually able to show that yes that bond is partially overlapped because that bond is just a little bit shorter. 
So that's the reason why these are more stable because you have that partial overlap. Whereas up here, it's just two isolated double bonds that are independent of each other. So that's what the partial overlap means. And you can do computer modeling, and I think they probably show pictures of those, of the charges where it shows a little bit of overlap, but it was only recently that somebody said, hey, yeah, we've got evidence that that bond is actually shorter. And it took a long time because they had to substitute hydrogens for deuteriums. He came here and gave a talk on it. It was, it was pretty interesting that something that accepted had never really been proven. And then when it gets proven, it gets proven at an undergraduate institution. Overland's a little up there in undergraduate, but still. It wasn't graduate students that did that discovery. It was undergrads with working with him. So that was pretty interesting. So that's what the partial overlap means. So when we add for Wednesday, when we start adding HCl to this, to this conjugated diene, one product we can predict, the other one we can't right now. So we got to figure out where that product comes from. And then we're going to get multiple products. So then the next question is, which one's the major product? And the answer is, it depends. And then we'll go down that road again. What else? Uh, there was looked like there were a couple of Piazza questions that I just that I didn't get a chance to answer because I saw them this morning. Um, any everybody okay with epoxides? I mean, obviously, we'll find out from the quiz. Okay, so for today, the, the for today the the remainder of the oh, oxidations. I want to go over like this problem that we had on the which one, the oxidation one. Yeah. Yeah. So oxidations. I didn't get a chance to talk about oxidations on on Friday, but but oxidation of alcohols. Um, and I did write something out and post it on Piazza, but I'll, I'll go through that here. So for oxidation, the issue is you can turn an alcohol into a carbonyl. The question is, what type of alcohol is it? Because that will tell you the type of carbonyl that you can make. And there's obviously three types of alcohols we could work with. A primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. So the first thing is oxidation means I'm going to lose hydrogens to form the CO double bond. That's the only way the CO double bond is going to form. Tertiaries, you cannot oxidize. So there's going to be no reaction when you react a tertiary alcohol with an oxidizing reagent. It just doesn't react. Secondaries become ketones. And primaries will follow the oxidation scheme for primary alcohols, aldehydes, and carboxylic acids. So the first thing you could oxidize your primary alcohol too is the aldehyde. And aldehydes can be oxidized to carboxylic acids. So there's a whole scheme here of oxidation and reduction of being able to go primary aldehyde carboxylic acid and then back down. And I think in my class we may have talked about this but just to refresh everyone's memory, when you were doing cleavage, when you were saying, okay, I'm going to take this double bond and I'm going to treat it with ozone and H2O2. That was ozonolysis, which was an oxidative cleavage. You cleave the double bond, 
and that turned each of those two carbons into a carbonyl. So the piece on the left became a ketone. The piece on the right initially became an aldehyde. And then with the aldehyde part, we had to look at the reagent and say, does that reagent oxidize the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid? And that's what I mean by this scheme up here. The aldehyde is not stable in an oxidizer, and it will go up to a carboxylic acid. So in this case, what happens is the ozone cleaves this to form aldehyde and ketone. The H2O2 then oxidizes that aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. So the final products of those that ozonolysis reaction was a ketone and a carboxylic acid. And that's the reason why we got to carboxylic acid, was because the aldehyde was further oxidized. So in this scheme, most of the, the oxidizers will take a carb primary um, alcohol the way to a carboxylic acid. And there's only a few that won't. So in terms of oxidation reactions, what we have to think of is, okay, what are strong oxidizers and what are, are milder oxidizers? So that's where there's a whole list of strong oxidizers. They can be things like H2O2. They can be things like KMNO4. They can be chromic acid, CrO3, H2SO4. Um, they can be Cr, uh, potassium, Cr2O7, which is, which is dichromate. Many of these involve basically a chromium 6 plus ion. In the case of aldehydes, oxygen can be an oxidizer so that this step of going from aldehyde to carboxylic acid under all these conditions will happen. So with a, like for instance, if I go down to the stock room and I want an aldehyde, and I go down there and I see half the bottle is solid and half the bottle is liquid. The reason that half the bottle is solid is because the oxygen has oxidized the aldehyde to carboxylic acid, Carboxylic acids strongly hydrogen bond to each other. They form solids, and it, fo it falls out of the solution. So with an aldehyde, you have to always like pre-purify it because it will always have carboxylic acid in it. Um, so that's as little as oxygen. But most of these are what we would use, potassium permanganate, et cetera. Um, so these strong oxidizers will take a primary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid. So that would be the strong oxidizers. They will also then take a secondary alcohol and they will oxidize it to a ketone. And then tertiary alcohols, because you can't form a CO double bond, won't react. So any primary or secondary with a strong oxidizer is going to form a carboxylic acid and a ketone. That's, that's what happens with the strong oxidizers. And the reason is because you go from primary aldehyde, aldehyde gets oxidized up. So that's the usefulness of all of these, these kinds of reactions. Now, there are some issues with this. Um, Potassium permanganate isn't too terribly bad. Peroxide isn't too terribly bad in terms of environmental friendliness. Chromium-6 chromium six is a, is a big issue. If I was making a drug for a drug company, I would have to show that the chromium is out of the product completely, which is almost impossible. And so there's rules in synthesis for drugs that you can't use any heavy metals within like the last X number of steps of your synthesis because you can't prove that all the metal is gone. Chromium-6 is orange in color. It was the whole, well, there were two bases for the movie Aaron Brockovich, which is really old. 
um, by today's standards. Number one, it was about lawyers, and number two, it was about environmental issues around chromium-6. The chromium-6 was, was and may still be used in certain circumstances to keep scale from building up on the pipes. And so when it gets out into the environment, um, it could go into the well water, which was the whole point of that movie causing cancer. If you looked at that, they actually had this big green pond. They're like, that's chromium. Uh, chromium-6 is orange. Chromium-3 plus is uh, green. So, and chromium-6, as soon as it touches oxygen and stuff, will turn into chromium-3. And then there's a chromium that you can go over to CVS and buy and take as a supplement. That's neither of those two. So it's not only just metal, it's oxidation state of the metal as well. So that was, so it's, it's frowned upon in terms of its um, use in these oxidizers. People have come up with much friendlier ways. Um, you can use actually bleach and acid to do oxidation used to use um, hypochlorite and acid. And that will do and that will do an oxidation. Remember you never mix bleach and acid when you're cleaning stuff because it'll make chlorine gas. And you will basically like gas yourself. So if you're cleaning something in the bathroom, never mix those two together. Or you will see a green gas come out. I believe was like that's World War One. If you wanted, if you want a toxic gas to kill troops, that's the number one is chlorine. I'm supposed to be mentoring a student from one of the high schools, and she chose chemical warfare as her topic. I think she's still working on it, and then I have to explain the chemistry to her, which will be fun since I don't know that myself. Um, so I'll have to learn it. But anyway. Um, so chromium-6 is not environmentally friendly, but the rest of them aren't too terribly bad. Um, so then the question is, how do you make, what reagent goes to make just the aldehyde? And so there's actually three sets of reagents that you'll see for that. The first is called PCC, and everybody just calls it PCC. It's called pyridinium pyridinium chlorochromate. And there's also a PDC, which is a pyridinium dichromate. So the, at the time these were developed, they were the only reagents that would stop in an aldehyde. So they were actually very important. I think one of these is called the Corey Suggs reagent, and I remember uh, Bill Suggs being a professor when I was a postdoc at Brown. I didn't quite realize that they were the same person. Um, so PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate, is you take a pyridine molecule, which has basically a nitrogen inside of a benzene ring. That's pyridine. Um, you add HCl to that, so you protonate the nitrogen, and we'll talk about that later, that's a pyridinium ion. Then you have its counter ion, the chloride, and then the chromate is just basically CrO3. So if you add pyridine and HCl to, to the chromic acid, what you do is you essentially tune it down. It's not as reactive. It's like the Lindler, it's like a Lindler approach. If your reagent's too hot or too reactive, kill it a little bit, poison it. That's essentially what they're doing here. This introduces pyridine, which is another bad chemical. Um, pyridine is a reproductive hazard primarily for men, and so um, you're just creating an environmental hazard here. But for many, many, many years, it was the only reagent to use, and so you just had to use it carefully. The other way to do this is what's called SWERN, oxidation and swern oxidation um, you could just say swern swern oxidation involves using a using dimethyl sulfoxide which is dmso um, which we normally think of as an aprotic um, polar solvent 
but Swern uses DMSO and something else to do an oxidation. It is, it's more environmentally friendly. And then there's a third one that's, you, that's used in books, and that's called Desmartin Pariodate. And so the pariodate is basically an, is a, is an iodine species. Um, so really we use PCC or Swern or Desmartin. Desmartin is actually also environmentally friendly because it doesn't involve any chromium-6. And I think we had an aldehyde that we were trying to oxidize to an aldehyde. And I think I still have the reagents for that. It worked really well. Except when you, except when the students started to shake it, it sprayed everywhere because you have to be very careful with pressure buildup, and the pressure built up abnormally fast, so it kind of sprayed everywhere. A little bit of it sprayed everywhere. So those three work well. Two of them environmentally friendly. One is not, um, and so those are these are classified classified as mild. So going back to the scheme then, going back to the scheme of these mild versus strong reagents, any of the mild reagents will oxidize a primary alcohol to an aldehyde and stop. They will also oxidize a secondary to a ketone. So they also will oxidize and form ketones. So to be honest, they're the ones you have to remember because they're the ones that have a very specific purpose. But that's, uh, that's alcohol oxidation um, in a nutshell. There are times when Particularly, the chromium was used in the past. So if the chromium-6 is orange and the chromium-3 plus that results after the reaction is green, there have been, um, there are tests where somebody gave you an alcohol or you knew you had an alcohol. Let's say you have an unknown compound, you run an IR on it, you see the huge OH peak. And you say, I have an alcohol. Then the next question is what kind, primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, one of the things you can do is treat it with chromium-6. If the orange color becomes green, that means the reaction occurred, which means it's either primary or secondary. If, it's ter if it stays orange, it's tertiary. So there are those kinds of color tests you can do for functional groups that, um, as you're learning about NMR now, that we don't necessarily have to do. Because now we can tell whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, totally from spectroscopy. So that was oxidation that I didn't get to on Friday. But now that I've gotten to it, we can make that part of Wednesday's quiz. That's the way it works. What other questions did you have? Can we do an example? An example of that? Sure. There are examples in the practice problems, but let's say... So let's say I said you have that alcohol, you want to make an aldehyde out of it, you want to make a carboxylic acid out of it. If we're thinking backwards, we'd look at this and say, okay, how do I make the aldehyde? And you would have one of three choices. You could say, I'm going to use PCC. You could say, I'm going to do Swern, or I'm going to do Desmartin. If I'm going to oxidize it to a carboxylic acid, which what would I use? Any of them. You could use Camino 4, 
CrO3 with H2SO4 and any of the other any of the other reagents. Does it matter which one Nope. Any strong will take this primary to the carboxylic acid, any mild will take to the aldehyde. If this was a secondary system, so if this would and this is where sometimes people um, if there's if there's a point where people make mistakes on this early, from my experience, it's that if I gave you this reaction, what would we get? <coughs> we're going to get the ketone. So we're going to convert the secondary alcohol to a ketone. Because PCC is mild, but mild will oxidize primaries to aldehydes and secondaries to ketones. So if you wanted to perform that transformation, if you wanted to say, okay, I want to take this secondary alcohol and I want to make a ketone out of it, the list here of reagents is everything. Everything will work there. What sometimes happens is that people will look at this reaction and they'll say, oh, well, PCC is only with primary alcohols. No, it will work with secondaries as well. So where people make their initial mistake, this is not correct, they will look at this and they'll go, no reaction. No, this does react just like all the other oxidizers, so you get a ketone out of it. So that's the oxidation. And there were a couple more in there, and I think there were even a couple more in some problems that I either released or I will release with the oxidations. But since we didn't go over on Friday, I didn't make it part of today's quiz. Okay. What other questions? So here's a reaction. What would be the product of this reaction? Without rearrangement. Anybody have an answer? I just did the same thing but with the BR or the OH. So replace the OH with a BR. Do we agree with that? Anybody get stuck? I don't know where to start. I got stuck. I didn't know where to start. So help me. I'm looking at this. I don't remember that's what the product is. So what should be the first step in the mechanism? Um, the H would go to the OH to make water. Protonate the oxygen. I'm going to protonate the oxygen. Okay. I make my oxonium ion, and I'm going to skip the transition states for this and just write the intermediates. Okay, I've got that, um, I've got that oxonium ion, what happens next? 
Um, that's a good question. So our choices are that the bromine could come in and kick the water off or the water can leave on its own. Here's how we make that decision. Can I form a stable carbocation if the water leaves? Yes, because what kind of carbocation would that be? Secondary. So whenever you can form a secondary or a secondary or tertiary carbocation, the water is going to leave. So I'm going to end up with. So I'm going to lose water, and I'm going to end up with a secondary carbocation. And then what happens next? Br minus comes in and adds to form our final product. So that would be the mechanism for that reaction. Why is it important that I write out the mechanism? Because you might have to next Monday. And if you're looking at that going, oh, that's review. Yeah, unfortunately it is. So we have done this in the past. But basically, the, basically if the leaving group can leave and form a stable carbocation, it will which then leads to the question of why, what happens in this case? What if I make that a primary? What's gonna happen? I'm gonna do the same thing, right? I'm gonna protonate the oxygen. I make my leaving group, my oxonium ion, my water molecule, and can it leave? No, because then I get a primary carbocation. So instead, what has to happen? The Br minus would come in and kick the water molecule off. And I would end up then with replacing again the OH with a BR. But these two reactions occurred by two different mechanisms. Um, I'll think about that. Because for like the epoxides, there would be no transition states. It would just be intermediates. So we probably would just do intermediates so that I don't have to go back and forth. Um, but I, I'll think about that. And for these kinds of problems, there are some um, practice problems in terms of writing the mechanisms. And you might say, was this really part of today's reading? It kind of was. Um, the middle one, the middle reaction there, or that, yeah, it's basically the, what kind of mechanism would you classify that as? I am substituting an OH for a BR. So your first answer should be substitution. One or two? SN1 or SN2 for this one? It's SN1. SN1? Why? Because it, it forms a carbocation. So now what we have to do is we've got to broaden our definition of SN1 and SN2 out. SN1 reactions or any one reaction involves a carbocation. A2 mechanism does not. An oxonium ion is not a carbocation. So for this reaction, I would classify this as SN1. Down here, what would I classify that reaction as? I would classify this one as... SN2, because it did not involve a carbocation. So I would say this is an SN2 mechanism, this is an SN1 mechanism. Do all SN2 mechanisms go by one step? Not necessarily. Right. This one I'd say, hey, we did this. If you were in lab last semester or any other previous semester here, we did this. It's just we used sulfuric acid to protonate the OH 
and sodium bromide to do the reaction. So it was SN2, two steps, but no carbocations. Okay. So the issue with, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because this was the basis for the reactions that were, that were in the book for today. Number one, this reaction, whenever we're trying to react to primary alcohol, takes a lot of heat. You've got a reflux. So we had the reflux the last semester for 45 minutes. Is there another way to convert the OH to a BR or a CL that is a little bit easier? And the answer is yes. So if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to convert those molecules, if I want to convert a primary alcohol into, an, into a halide, let's say a chloride, the reagents that I can use that will do this more efficiently are things like SOCl2, which is thionyl chloride, or PCl3 or PCl5. So those reagents, and they all have bromine equivalents. So SOBr2, PCl, or PBr3, PBr5. All of those reagents actually are much smoother in their converting OH to Cl or converting OH to Br. And so they're preferred for primaries. They're preferred for primary alcohols because they work a lot better. Right. Then there's the issue of rearrangement. So when I react this molecule, which was the one before, I said, let's do the reaction without rearrangement. Now let's do it with rearrangement. If I do it with rearrangement, what happens? I protonate the OH, the water leaves, and that carbocation could rearrange to form a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable. And then the Br minus could come in and add to the carbocation. So this molecule could undergo rearrangement. I'm not quite sure to the extent that it would, but it could. And so if it did and I wanted to eliminate that possibility, what I would end up doing is I would end up not using HBr, but using SOBr2 or PBr3 or PB5, or PBr5. So in other words, these reagents have the advantage of they react better with primaries, but they also do not undergo rearrangements. So if you have a system that is likely to rearrange, I can use any of these reagents as alternatives to replace the OH with a CL. And that's their function. That's all they do is replace OH with CL or OH with BR. That's what they do. So all the reagents that were talked about in the reading and in the video, all those reagents, they are just simply to replace OH with a halogen. We could do the same thing with HX, with HCl or HBr, but these overcome those side reactions that you might get. Can you say that top ones would keep from doing rearrangement? Right. These ones, these ones react faster. They have faster reactions, particularly with primaries, and they do not. They do not undergo rearrangement. So that's advantages of using those. Do they still react with secondaries? Yes, they react with secondaries and tertiaries very nicely. But that's where if you had a secondary or tertiary, you could just add HCl or HBr, they react very, they react, but if they're going to rearrange, then you would want to use those. 
So these ones are primarily used for primaries and when you don't want rearrangement, but you can use them at any time. And so that's the point. The point is these are really nice reagents to turn OHs into halogens. And this is one of the cases where you'd want to do that for primaries. The other case would be if you wanted to convert an OH group into a double bond. Okay, and I did write out a little bit, I did write out a, some examples of how we use the tosylate esters to accomplish this in Piazza. So if you haven't taken a look at that, I would strongly encourage you to do that. It's not a video, but it was just written out. And we'll, we'll end it with saying, can I do this reaction? Can I convert OH to the most substituted double bond? And the answer is yes. It's a piece of cake. We can use sulfuric acid and heat and do a dehydration reaction. That would always form the most substituted, most stable double bond. In this case, that means that that reaction goes by E1. problem is, how do you do the first one? I don't want to form the most substitute bond. I can do that. I want to form the least substitute double bond. Just going to use the, I don't know what it's called, but it has like the salt in the middle of it with the two oxygen in this guy? Yes. We use, it's a thionyl, it's a sulf, it's the uh, tosyl. We use a tosyl chloride to make this a tosyl ester. Anybody want to use terch butoxide? Problem is, and somebody, somebody at first glance would probably say, let's use terch butoxide. Because terch butoxide makes the most well, makes the least least uh, substitute double bond. But what do we re react terch butoxide with? Alkyl halides. A terch butoxide in another alcohol is going to do what? Deprotonate it. There's going to be an equilibrium. But I'm not going to do E2 because you need NH2 minus and terch butoxide need halides. So you cannot react this alcohol with terch butoxide, but what do I now know how to do? Convert that to a Cl and then use terch butoxide. Or convert this to the new tosylate ester, then use terch butoxide. So there's way around that, but terch butoxide will not react. Okay? So please take on um, Piazza. I, I've been limiting the number of videos simply because then you can download that file and put it in your notes. But I went over this. If you have any questions, resubmit something or come and see me and we can go over and we can go over that. I'll send the list for Wednesday's quiz out um, later today. And the reading assignment for Wednesday is already up.